Dr. James Strickler. And this is a course in United States history. This lecture concerns Chapter 27, the 60s, in the United States History textbook, American Yop. The first section in this chapter deals with Kennedy and Cuba. This is but the first major crisis in a decade full of crises and controversies. The root of the crisis in Cuba was the Cuban Revolution led by Fidel Castro that culminated in him coming to power in 1959. After the Spanish-American War, the United States assisted with Cuba becoming independent from Spain. This then led to a series of rulers in Cuba that were friendly to the United States, particularly to United States business. In the lead up to the Cuban Revolution, as the common people of Cuba felt they were being oppressed by their rich rulers, the United States tended to be supportive of those rulers because they created a good business environment for Americans to flourish there. So the United States met the Cuban Revolution with suspicion, particularly as Fidel Castro turned toward the Soviet Union and communism for help. This led to many wealthy and middle class citizens of Cuba to flee when Fidel de Castro came to power. They settled in southern Florida mostly, in the Miami area, and became some of the most patriotic Americans still to this day. After the Cuban Revolution, and it became clear that Cuba was all allying itself with the, the communists um, in the world, the United States instituted an embargo on trade with Cuba. The hope was that this would weaken the communist regime as it would have economic difficulties since it could no longer trade with its primary trading partner, the United States. But it caused the Cubans to just dig in, to become even more aligned with the Soviets and the communists in the East. Shortly after the embargo had been instituted on Cuba, a United States presidential election was held in which John F. Kennedy narrowly defeated Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was the sitting vice president, vice president to Dwight Eisenhower. Remember that Richard Nixon had become famous as a communist fighter while he served in the House of Representatives. But in contrast to him, John F. Kennedy was seen as younger, more handsome, more um, energetic, signaling a new day for America. That's probably the biggest reason why John F. Kennedy won. An example of how this played out was in their first televised debate. This was something new in American politics, presidential candidates debating live on TV for the country to see. And there was an interesting contrast between those who listened to the debate on the radio and those who watched it on television. Those who listened to it on the radio thought Richard Dick Nixon did much better than those who watched it on TV. This was attributed to um, John F. Kennedy being more handsome. So when he was on TV with his full head of hair and his handsome features compared to Richard Nixon's balding head and less attractive features, and Richard Nixon's, in fact, a less attractive suit that he wore, this caused people to naturally think that Kennedy did better. This was the beginning of an era that we are still in where looks matter for politicians. After John F. Kennedy came to power, he continued the policy of the United States toward the communist regime in Cuba, wanting to see it fail. And he thought that he had an opportunity to prompt that failure in 1961 when the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, recommended it to him that an invasion be staged using um, Cubans that had fled to the United States. The thought was that if they returned to Cuba armed with um, uh, arms supplied by the United States and began fighting against the Cuban regime, that the people of the country would rise up and join them to cast, cast off the rule of the communists. Well, this plan was put into action 
and the Cuban exiles in the United States, armed by the United States government, invaded Cuba at a place called the Bay of Pigs. Well, it quickly was a failure. Rather than the people of the countryside in Cuba rising up to help the uh, invaders, instead they came to the defense of their communist government. When the invasion failed, this was a big black mark on the presidency of John F. Kennedy. His failure in staging a revolution in Cuba just emboldened the uh, Soviet regime to be some more, more supportive of the Cubans. And it caused the Cubans to turn even more to our communist enemies in the East. So what this led to then was Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union, seeking to station uh, nuclear missiles in Cuba that then could quickly hit targets within the United States. Remember, this is in the middle of the Cold War and a nuclear arms race. And having missiles on the doorstep of the other country could be a big strategic advantage if a nuclear war ever happened. Cuba, being only 90 miles off the southern coast of Florida, would put communist missiles almost right in our backyard. Well, to prevent this from happening, John F. Kennedy, when spy planes alerted to him to the building of the missile bases in Cuba, ordered a uh, essentially a blockade of Cuba, though he was not willing to call it a blockade. Instead, it was referred to as a quarantine. United States military vessels um, prevented Soviet vessels from reaching Cuba to arm the, the missile sites with nuclear missiles. Well, as the Soviet fleet approached Cuba, there was a standoff between the two countries. Would the Russians try to force their way through? Would the United States actually stop them? Would this lead to war? This became a real possibility. It's the closest the United States has ever come to actual nuclear war. But at the last minute, a compromise was reached and the Soviets backed down and recalled their ships. In exchange for that, the United States removed some missiles that it had stationed in Turkey relatively close to the Soviet Union. In the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis, even more Cubans continued to flee to the United States to escape the oppressions of the communist regime there. This led to a law being passed to give the Cubans special status in the United States called the Cuban Adjustment Act. Under the Cuban Adjustment Act, refugees from Cuba could become a permanent residence of the United States and eventually work their way toward citizenship. This sort of put them at the head of the line of other immigrants around the world. This was a product of the Cold War and our desire to undermine the communist regime in Cuba, which was so close to the United States. The United States relationships, relationship with Cuba was not the only point of controversy and crisis during the 1960s. The civil rights movement was also an area where great, great controversy occurred. This was particularly caused by the entry of students, college students, into the civil rights movement. They were more confrontational and more demanding of swift change than their elders had been. One of the first examples of the influence of college students on the civil rights movement was the Greensboro sit-ins, where three young black men, college students, decided to engage in an act of nonviolent civil disobedience by going to a lunch counter in a department store and asking to be served, though the lunch counter was for whites only. They knew that, they, that this would cause problems and eventually they would be kicked out and perhaps arrested. But that was the point. The point of nonviolent civil disobedience is to challenge something that they think is bad, then cause the other side to react in a way that may be violent, but in the end will make the other side look like the bad guys. So in this example, we have three young black college men who come to a lunch, lunch counter and simply order something like hamburgers and milkshakes. In the end, the police may show up and beat them up and drag them out into the street. 
but then this will get reported as them simply asking for a milkshake and getting beaten up for it. This is about changing the public's perception of segregation and other civil rights problems. And it ended up being a very effective strategy. Another strategy used by students in the 1960s to, cha to challenge segregation in the South was for white college students from the North, along with black allies, to board buses that then would travel through the South into segregated areas, essentially flaunting the segregation laws of the areas by driving through on integrated buses. They had legal justification for doing this because the Interstate Commerce Commission had ruled long before that buses moving in interstate um, travel could not be segregated. But they just didn't stop the segregationists of the South from attacking these freedom riders that were passing through their areas. In some cases, even destroying the buses that they were traveling on and assaulting the riders on the buses. But again, like with the sit-ins, in the end, as the images of these confrontations get shown around the country, in other places, it would appear that the segregationists were the bad guys for having beat up the Freedom Riders or set their buses on fire. This is another step in changing public opinion around the country to be against the segregationist policies of the South. The city of Albany, Georgia became a center for the uh, conflicts of the civil rights movement. There in Albany, um, activists and ministers um, gathered together along with students to challenge the segregationist policies in the city. Interestingly, the police chief of the city of Albany saw what was happening and realized that he was in a tough place. The segregationists in the area, of course, wanted him to shut down the protests and the, the, the disobedient actions. But he didn't want to make martyrs out of the people that were involved. So in a strange tactic, he would arrest the protesters and then bail them out them himself so that they could go free. In this way, he tried to walk a middle ground between the two sides. But not all places were the, the protests handled as peacefully as they were in Albany. For example, in Mississippi, when the University of Mississippi was ordered to desegregate, and a man named James Meredith became the, the first black student to attend there, riots erupted on the campus, and National Guardsmen had to be called in to put down the riots. These riots were white people wanting to challenge the idea of the university being integrated. We ended up then with a battle on campus between the protesters and the National Guard brought in to put down the riots, and two people were even killed in what became known as the Battle of Old Miss. The Battle of Old Miss was not the only place where violence erupted as civil rights tried to make progress. Another example came in the Birmingham campaign, where civil rights activists came to focus their actions in the city of Birmingham, Alabama. This was led by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization created by Martin Luther King and others. In 1963, as they stepped up their protests within the city, city authorities responded by harassing, attacking, and arresting the protesters. Here in this famous picture, you have local firefighters hosing the protesters to try to remove them from the street. Once again, as we've seen in the previous examples, these confrontations that were um, prompted by the actions of the protesters end up actually serving their purpose as well, as they are violently attacked, even though they are acting peacefully, thus making their attackers be the ones that the public ends up disliking. This leads to opinion changing across the country in favor of the civil rights protesters. During the Birmingham campaign, the young Martin Luther King, the minister who um, was one of the great leaders of the civil rights movement, was arrested and jailed. While in jail, he wrote a famous uh, handwritten letter urging not only his nonviolent approach 
but active confrontation to directly challenge injustice. Even as he was put in jail, he tried to inspire others to go out and challenge the very same things that he was arrested for challenging. In response to these civil rights protests, there was, of course, a backlash by the traditionalists in the white community. They found a leader in the man, na man named George Wallace. George Wallace was a uh, governor of the state of Alabama. And he famously said that, that there would be segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. He even claimed that he would personally stand in the doorway of a schoolhouse before allowing it to be integrated. He made such a symbolic gesture before the integration of the University of Alabama by standing in the doorway of one of its buildings. There, he gave a speech in favor of segregation and then made way and the University of Alabama was integrated despite his protests. That same year in 1963, a matter of fact, just a day later after Wallace had stood in the schoolhouse door and been criticized for doing so by John F. Kennedy, one of the civil rights leaders in the South, a man named Medgar Evers, who lived in Mississippi, was assassinated in his own front yard. He was not the only civil rights champion that was assassinated along the way. There's a whole list of them that would it'll eventually include men like Malcolm X and um, Martin Luther King also. The civil rights movement was reaching a crest during this time period. The activists realized that they were making progress and it was time to push their cause even more. This led the organization to the organization of a mass march on Washington, D.C. in 1963, where hundreds of thousands of people came to Washington, D.C. to protest segregation through the country. The highlight of the march on Washington, D.C. was when Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. In that speech, he spoke of a day sometime in the future when his own children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This was the King's vision for a better America, where people would be judged on their merits rather than by their race. Even as the country may have felt that it was turning a corner for the better, bad things nonetheless continued to happen. In 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated while visiting the city of Dallas, Texas. A gunman fired shots from a building overlooking the president's motorcade route. He killed him as well as wounding some other people in the motorcade. In the aftermath, President Lyndon Johnson, excuse me, Vice President Lyndon Johnson became the President of the United States. You can see him being sworn in in the picture to the right on this slide. Lyndon Johnson was a Southerner from Texas, but he's a man that had grown up in poverty and understood the trials of those people who felt less fortunate or oppressed by society. So he decided to take up um, the cause of civil rights and become its champion when he became president. John F. Kennedy had not been excited about the civil rights movement until the assassination, excuse me, until George Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door and Medgar Evers was assassinated. John F. Kennedy then favored civil, new civil rights legislation, but he did not live long enough to champion it. So President Lyndon Johnson did that instead. Lyndon Johnson's presidency in the middle of the 1960s was significant both for what it did in the way of progress for civil rights, as well as the controversies that it created with the Vietnam War. As I said previously, Lyndon Johnson decided to take up the cause of civil rights as president. He ended up championing what became known as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 one of the most important and far-reaching pieces of legislation in American history. 
the Civil Rights Act of 1964 did a bunch of things. But perhaps the most important thing that it did was that it outlawed private racial discrimination within the United States. So, while in the past governments had potentially done discriminatory practices such as segregation, and those had been ruled unconstitutional by the courts, private citizens could continue to segregate and discriminate since the Constitution does not prohibit the actions of private people. So what happened was Congress passed a law prohibiting private discrimination. The Civil Rights Act then was a powerful tool in changing the racial makeup of society. But even as there was success happening in uh, Congress in the cause of civil rights, young people continued to push the issue, such as in the Freedom Summer of 1964, where various student groups, including one called the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE for short, descended upon Mississippi, which they felt was the, the worst offender as far as discrimination, discrimination against blacks in the country. There, they, what they tried to do was register blacks to vote. The feeling was that the more voters that they could get to the polls, the more opportunity they would have to change the policy of Mississippi from within. The following year, and a significant civil rights event took place in the city of Selma in Alabama. Their voting rights activists who wanted to make sure that black people could freely vote in the state of Mississippi also, excuse me, the state of Alabama also, planned a big symbolic march from the city of Selma all the way to the state capitol in Montgomery. They tried to initiate the march a couple of times and were beaten down in the process of trying to do so. Their attempt on a Sunday became known as Bloody Sunday, as their peaceful protest was broken up by white law enforcement officials using um, batons and tear gas. Eventually, uh, weeks later, they successfully completed the 50 mile march, but they could not do it on the Bloody Sunday because of the attack from the law enforcement officers. As the nation saw these sorts of controversies, Congress then decided to do something about it and passed the Voting Rights Act in 1965, which then Lyndon Johnson signed as president, which abolished various types of uh, voter discrimination in the country, such as, for example, the use of literacy tests to try to screen out black voters. But even as Lyndon Johnson championed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which were both by themselves important pieces of legislation, he had even grander ambitions for the country. In 1964, at a graduation um, ceremony at the University of Michigan, Lyndon Johnson gave a speech in which he outlined what he called the Great Society that he imagined that he could transform America into. He wanted to tackle um, both poverty and racial injustice in the United States and end them forevermore through a series of government programs. Among these programs that he advocated that were eventually passed was what is commonly known as food stamps. This great society program provided vouchers that people of low income could use to buy food. This same sort of program exists today, but generally rather than providing people with coupons that they could use to purchase food with, it is done electronically through um, what look like letter, credit cards, which are commonly known as EBT cards, electronic benefit transfers is what it stands for. But it's the same idea. People below a certain income are automatically given assistance to buy food. Another area that the Great Society addressed was health care. Twin programs called Medicare and Medicaid were established in 1965, 
to make sure that people could get at least minimal levels of health care in the United States, even if they couldn't afford it. Medicare was a program to provide um, medical care for the elderly. Medicaid did so for, pe for poor people. Together, the idea was that in America, everybody would be able to receive health care, even if they couldn't afford to go out and purchase it for themselves. Another great society program was the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which provided federal funding for schools throughout the country. Now, this money was contingent on those schools abiding by various federal rules and regulations. This, in effect, brought the national government in control of the educational system in the country that had previously just been administered by the states. Another pair of Great Society programs were the established the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. These twin programs provided funding for things like teaching the humanities, art, um, history, things like that in school, while also funding artists to produce things like paintings and plays, etc. This was part of Lyndon, Johnson, Lyndon Johnson's vision of using the government to actively enrich society, not just to help the poor out, but to give us all a better quality of life. Now, I want to be careful here. I've been speaking um, what might be perceived as very positively about the Great Society programs. I'm explaining why they were instituted, but there's actually debate to this day about whether or not they were effective and whether or not they were a waste of money. Together, the Great Society programs are often described as being a war on poverty, as various programs like food stamps, Medicare, Medicaid, etc., were put in place to lift people of low income to a better status in life. Overall, since the institution of the Great Society, our country has spent over $25 trillion on such programs. Yet, as can be seen in this graph, after the institution of the Great Society programs, as illustrated by the blue line, poverty no longer declined in the country, even as the expenditures on those programs continue to increase, which is the red line. So you have to wonder about the effectiveness of government programs that can spend $25 trillion over the course of um, over 50 years and not really change the level of poverty in the country. And that um, poverty that continued to seem to go on despite these government programs was one of the reasons that there was a series of race riots in the country, beginning with the Watts area of Los Angeles in 1965 and then Newark and Detroit in 1967. Black Americans were frustrated with their economic and social position and their seeming inability to move up the ladder. This was prompted also by accusations of police brutality and racial profiling and etc. There would usually be some precipitating event where there was some black person who the community believed had been treated unfairly and they took to the streets to protest. And then the protests got out of hand and they ended up in some cases burning down entire parts of cities. While the nonviolent civil disobedience of the early 1960s was clearly effective in getting support for the civil rights movement, these riots that took place in the mid 1960s were very counterproductive. Not only did they destroy the neighborhoods of the very people that were protesting, but they also made enemies of many people around the country who saw the protesters as being a destructive and selfish extremists. So while other situations may have cast the oppressors as the enemies, in this case, it was the victims who made themselves look bad by becoming the violent criminals during the riots. Part of the frustration, though, that led to the riots was the inability of blacks 
to leave communities where they felt that they had no real opportunities. Part of the reason for this was that when they would move into white neighborhoods, when they could get the financial ability to do so, what ended up happening is as a certain number of blacks moved into a white neighborhood, the whites would then pick up and move. Now, this wasn't just out of blatant racism. There were often financial concerns involved, whether it was uh, uh, something that was should be justified or not. What happened was when blacks moved into neighborhoods, property values dropped. So some white homeowners, when they saw black families moving in, would sell and move away just to preserve the value of their property, to sell it before the prices dropped, and then move into another all white area where they know that their, their home value would be maintained. Now, of course, that sounds awful from our modern standards, but it was a very rational decision that some of these people could have made, even if they were not themselves inherently racist. Even as Lyndon Johnson was leading the great society reforms in his war on poverty, another sort of war, an actual shooting war on the other side of the world would have a profound effect upon his presidency. The war in Vietnam was um, caused by the colonialism that had um, driven uh, European countries to establish colonies throughout the world. The country of France established a series of colonies in Southeast Asia in what was known as French Indochina. This included a colony of the people of Vietnam. Now, there was a period then after the Second World War when these European colonizers began to surrender control over their colonies around the world. But this idea of just simply turning rule over to a people so that they can rule themselves was not without complications. This is particularly true in places like Vietnam because the, the groups that were fighting most for the independence of these areas were in some cases um, extreme leftists or even communist um, political parties. And there was not a desire to turn over these lands to communism. There was a theory that people had called the domino theory, that if you allow one country to become communist, then it will influence the country next to it to become communist, will influence the country next to it to be communist, and in that way communism will spread all over the globe. Well, this domino theory would then cause people to not want Vietnam to be communist in the first place. So this meant that while France might want to move out of a colony or might not, it was being forced to do so by a communist insurgency. This was led by a man named Ho Chi Minh, a native Vietnamese man who had been educated in communist doctrine and was leading a revolution against the French with his followers, his military followers called the Viet Minh. France fought against them for many years, but they were not very successful. There was an attempt eventually to negotiate a peace treaty between the groups. In 1954, a peace conference was held in Geneva, Switzerland, between the French and the Vietnamese insurgents. The plan was to temporarily divide Vietnam between a communist north and a south that would be its own independent country that would be in association with France. Eventually there would be US, excuse me, United Nations monitored elections that would decide whether the entire country would become communist or whether the entire country would become um, some sort of capitalist country friendly to the democracies of the West. But the United States was concerned that if such a vote were held, that it would go against the United States wishes and the entire country would vote to become communist. 
So the United States actually used its power within the United States, excuse me, within the United Nations to oppose that planned national vote, which never took place. This then led to an organization of communist rebels arising in South Vietnam. They were called the Viet Cong, and they pushed to end the permanent partition of Vietnam by uniting it all as a single communist country under the rule of Ho Chi Minh. Now, because the United States was concerned about the domino theory, the United States sent 16,000 advisors to Vietnam to assist the South Vietnamese in fighting against this Viet Cong insurgency. By this point, France had abandoned its colonies in Southeast Asia, and the United States took over as the, the de facto foreign influence. The United States was there, as we've discussed a moment ago, because of the domino theory, this belief that Vietnam could not allow, be allowed to become communist, or this would then lead to other to communism spreading in places like Indonesia and eventually Australia, etc., etc. But the United States military advisors were supposedly there to just train the South Vietnamese to fight for themselves. The United States was trying to avoid getting bogged down in another foreign war. But then in 1964, an excuse for war happened in the Gulf of Tonkin off the, the coast of Vietnam. When the United States warship, the USS Maddox, reported that it was under attack by Vietnamese, North Vietnamese boats. Now, there is some um, concern that the USS Maddox's reports were either falsified or mistaken. Nonetheless, they became the excuse for the United States to declare war upon North Vietnam and begin deploying United States combat troops to the region. This is the beginning of the United States involvement in the Vietnam War. Well, not everyone was excited about go the idea of going to Vietnam. In particular, young people, students, decided to pro protest against the, the Vietnam War. This was exactly what the North Vietnamese were hoping for. They realized that they could not defeat the United States military on the, on the field of battle in a straight up conflict. Instead, they needed to win the war by destroying the United States desire to fight anymore. They needed to make the war drag on. They needed to make it bloody. They needed to make sure that the United States felt, painfully felt, any progress that it made in Vietnam. Their hope was eventually that Americans would grow tired of the fight and that they would um, leave the field of battle and that Vietnam could then be, reu be reunited. It turned out that their strategy was correct. At the same time that the Vietnam War is accelerating, the United States is experiencing a cultural transition. This is the time period when the hippies appear, in which they are expressly trying to develop a culture that would be in opposition to the um, more conformist, traditional culture of the 1950s. The hippies want to focus on freedom, rebellion, and individuality. They champion things like drug use and sexual experimentation. They had an idealism and an earnestness about them that some critics saw as narcissism, in other words, an obsession with themselves. Well, whether the hippie movement was good or bad, it was definitely influential as young people who uh, believed that they could create a utopian peace in the world, opposed military actions like that in Vietnam. It was not just the hippies that were changing society. For example, a woman named Mary Quant in 1964 invented the fashion style called the miniskirt, a much shorter skirt than women had ever wore before. This was something of a liberating thing that women could wear much less restrictive clothing and essentially advertise themselves to the world. 
part of these societal changes also affect, affected um, uh, the political spectrum. Traditionally in America, when we thought of people as being on the political left, we were referring to liberals who focused on things like labor unions, for example, who um, might have uh, fought for um, Marxist ideals of the working class, that kind of thing. But in the 1960s, a new kind of liberalism arose called the New Left, which was much more focused on social issues such as civil rights, feminism, gay rights, abortion rights, gender rights, um, drug rights, things like that. Drugs were actually an important part of the counterculture movement as people within the movement experimented with various drugs to, as they would put it, um, open up their consciousness. One particularly popular drug was known as LSD, standing for Lysergic Acid Dithylamide. I hope I said that right. What LSD did was it would cause people to have um, uh, psychedelic visions, they sometimes put it, hallucinations. Um, spiritual visions, however they might describe it. People would see things that weren't really there when they were on LSD. Some people believe that this opened their minds to possibilities that they would other not, otherwise not understand. Well, regardless, it became a highly illegal thing to do, but people did it anyway. This is part of them expressing themselves. It wasn't just in the area of drugs, but it was also in the area of sex. In 1967, a, um, a concerted effort was made to bring uh, counterculture hippies from all over the country to San Francisco, particularly the Haight-Asbury district, for what they called a summer of love. It'd be a time where they could experience drugs and anti-war protests and free love, as they put it, um, and explore all these utopian ideals that they could have a peaceful world if they would just try. The culmination of this attitude came in the musical concert, commonly known as Woodstock, which took place in 1969. Woodstock was a giant, multi-day, multi-performer con concert that attracted hundreds of thousands of people to a dairy farm in New York State where the concert stages were set up. Amazingly, the concert came off with very little controversy as far as public safety, people weren't killed, there weren't riots, there, weren't, there wasn't a bunch of crime and fights. This seemed to confirm the counterculture's ideals that if they just believed in peace, they could make it happen. Well, that will not be true, as we will see in the next chapter eventually. We began talking about this decade by discussing the civil rights movement in the early 1960s. This was built around the ideals of Martin Luther King about peacefully pursuing civil rights to just gain equality. The basic idea was that black people just wanted to be treated by white people the same as white people treated other white people. But not all people act, active in the civil rights movement thought that that pursuit was good enough. This led to the establishment of what became known as the Black Power Movement. The Black Power Movement focused on um, blacks becoming self-sufficient. It was a demand for more violent action to counter what they perceived as, a, as white supremacy. They believed that they, the movement needed to get more in the face of people and demand not just equal treatment, but to demand their own place in society, even separate from whites. This is where we get things like black nationalism, the idea of forming a black nation separate from white America. One of the great champions of this black nationalism was a man named Malcolm X. He was a minister and public speaker for the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam is an, a Muslim organization which was exclusively black in nature. 
Malcolm X as one of the main spokespersons of this uh, nation of Islam believed that Martin Luther King's approach was too soft, that blacks needed to be more radical, more powerful in their approach, that they needed to um, pursue freedom, equality, and justice by any means necessary, even violence. Matter of fact, Malcolm X said that he wouldn't even call it violence if it was in self-defense. He would just call it being intelligent. Well, this in-your-face sort of style was something that Malcolm X definitely championed for a while until he made a trip to Mecca in Saudi Arabia for one of the great celebrations of the Muslim world and discovered that many of his Muslim brothers and sisters were white. This was an eye-opening experience for him, and when he returned to the United States, he renounced some of his previous anti-white separatist views. He ended up being assassinated for those changes by people that were believed to be affiliated with the Nation of Islam. Malcolm X was not the only one that saw a potential role for violence in the pursuit of black civil rights. Two men named Bobby Seale and Huey Newton established the Black Panther Party in 1966. While the Black Panther Party may have engaged in some good works, they were mostly known for their call to direct action and self-defense. That they believed that the black communities could only be liberated from white power by becoming self-sufficient in and of themselves. This included defending themselves. Black Panthers became famous for um, walking around carrying military-style assault weapons that were designed to, to protect themselves, they believed, from the white power structure that was around them. It was not just blacks, though, that felt that they needed to stand up and fight against the white majority. Native Americans did also which led to the Red Power Movement. The Red Power Movement was a series of protests across the country advocating for better treatment of Native Americans. Some of their most famous incidents came when they occupied the island of Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay for about a year and a half in protest of the treatment of, of, of Native Americans. They also held a giant um, gathering at the town of Wounded Knee in South Dakota where a famous uh, Native American massacre had occurred. Another group that organized to advocate for their position in society were Chicanos. Now, Chicano is not a name that we commonly use today. We're referring to what some people call today Latinos or Latinas or Hispanics, people whose ancestry was of mixed heritage both from Native Americans and European settlers from long ago. They believe particularly that Mexican Americans were not treated as well as they should be in the United States and rallied and protested on the behalf of people with um, Hispanic ancestry. Among the important leaders in the Chicano movement were two organizers of farm workers, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. Together they founded the National Farm Workers Association, a union representing uh, migrant farm workers, the people who pick things like lettuce and grapes. This had eventually become the United Farm Workers of America. Early on in its history, these leaders were successful in organizing uh, the labor of people who were oftentimes just immigrants in the United States, working, harvesting agricultural crops and sending the profits home to Mexico or wherever they were from. They were, Cesar Chavez was so effective in leading this movement that eventually his birthday became a legal holiday in several places in the country, such as California, Colorado, and Texas. The most extreme version of this, of this uh, Chicano movement was the organization called the Raza Unida. They wanted to actually form a, uh, a new country, I guess you could say, from the southwestern portion of the United States. 
set up a, they felt that this land had been stolen from their ancestors and it should be regained by them. In 1961, John F. Kennedy established a commission on the status of women who was to examine society to figure out where women were at and what actions might be taken to improve their situation. The committee ended up finding that there was significant discrimination against women in places like um, uh, practice of professions like of law, industry, labor, governmental organizations, etc. They recommended various changes to employment law, federal tax laws, things like that to better improve women's situations. But they were just talking about women in general, not necessarily the most vulnerable women's society, those who were at the bottom of the economic scale. An author named Betty Friedman gave, gave voice to what, some, what she de described as the problem that has no name in her book, The Feminine Mystique, published in 1963. This thing that she called the problem that has no name was the idea that women were um, finding themselves in roles in America that they had been put in because of traditions such as mother and housewife that they actually fight, might find very dissatisfying. And Betty Freeman said that this dissatisfaction was not a product of the woman being incapable of fulfilling her role, but rather it was a function of the society trying to force the role upon her. Johnny Tillman, a woman who is the, the black woman at the front of this picture on the left hand side, Formed a, helped form an organization called the National Welfare Rights Organization. She was a mother who ended up receiving welfare benefits from the United States government, but found them both inadequate and her opportunity to participate in figuring out how to make them adequate was too limited. So she created this organization so that people, particularly women who are on welfare to protect their, to uh, provide for their families, could try to better mold government policy to meet their needs. There was a great deal of organization and demonstration in favor of women's rights during the 1960s. One of the culminating events was 1970s Women's Strike for Equality, organized by the National Organization of Women, otherwise known as NOW, one of the most important women's organizations in the country. The idea was for women all over the country to take to the streets to protest their treatment and make it clear to everybody how needed they were when they were not at home doing the things that they had been expected to do. But interestingly, even though this was supposedly a strike for equality, the, the strike didn't begin until 5.30 p.m. to give people a chance to get off of work without getting punished or fired. In addition to women's issues, some people were concerned about environmental issues, including this author, Rachel Carson, who as a, as a biological amateur, produced a book called Silent Spring, which resonated with much of American society. Basically, she, had, she argued that pesticides, pesticides, pesticides had been used so extensively that they had created um, significant damage to the environment which would be eventually significantly damaging to um, um, humans who are dependent upon that environment. This book became an inspiration of sorts for the entire environmentalist movement that still has some power in America today. In that same year, excuse me, um, in 1970, eight years after um, Rachel Carson published the book Silent, um, spring, the causes that she had been advocating reached a potential turning point with the establishment of Earth Day. Earth Day was supposed to be a day of education about environmental issues, and over its many years since then, it continues to be um, uh, celebrated today. It has um, 
tried to change people's actual behaviors about the environment by educating them about the consequences of their actions and what they might do to make the world better from the view of those who organize Earth Day. This in general push toward being more concerned about the environment in fact in affected Richard Nixon and the presidency of the United States to take action to try to um, have the United States help with economic conditions. This involved the government requiring environmental assessments and impact statements regarding any projects that might have any sort of possible significant effect upon the environment. This meant that um, a company wanting to engage in some new business construction or practice that might have a negative effect on the environment would have to report that. And as a consequence, they might be denied the opportunity to participate in that new thing that they had planned. At the top of this new environmental bureaucracy was the Environmental Protection Agency created in 1970. The Environmental Protection Agency job was to regulate um, people's conduct toward the environment and to spread knowledge about how to better take care of it. The pressures toward um, reform that existed in the 1960s as the counterculture arose and um, demanded new ways of looking at the world also affected religious institutions. For example, the Catholic Church from the years 1962 to 1965 gathered its leadership for what became known as the Second Vatican Council where they discussed changes that could be made in the church to bring it more in line with the views of the time. Now this doesn't necessarily mean changing the doctrines of the church, but it does mean altering the conduct of the church, such as allowing for church services, what the Catholics call mass, to be conducted in the native language of the area where the church exists, rather than having to be done in the traditional language of Latin. This and other changes made to the Catholic Church show how it was also responding to the push for reform and change that came out of the 1960s. The 1960s then ended with an event that could be argued was out of place in the decade. Back in 1961, when President John F. Kennedy was president and the Soviets were beating the United States in the space race, he announced the intent of the United States to reach the moon before the Soviet Union, in fact, to reach it before the end of the decade. This was actually an important scientific achievement by the United States, and through that, a great weapon in the propaganda war between the Soviet Union. But it was the beginning of a vision of eventually colonizing the solar system and moving out into the stars, which many people expected to happen in the decades to come, but which failed to materialize. The 1960s showed that people were becoming more concerned about social problems than they were about great achievements like going to the moon. And in a few short years, the Apollo um, program would be ended without us having ever achieved things like a moon base. And that ends the material for this chapter, 27, the 60s, in the United States History Textbook, American Yop.